Ever since I saw amazing DOS games like Elite running on the PC or XT doing 3D graphics like this, I just knew that I had to figure out how to do this for myself. And so began a project to push 3D graphics as far as I possibly could on the IBM PC. With just a few hints along the way in videos on the channel, I largely worked on this in secret for almost two years, and I believe the time has come to update you on the results. My journey actually began years ago on the Amstrad PC1512 with an 8 MHz 8086 CPU, which is actually faster than this IBM PC. This was the first 3D effect that I did, and it was trouble enough to do fast line drawing, so I assumed I'd only ever be able to do wireframe 3D objects, like this rotating tetrahedron. It was a pretty primitive beginning. This is the strategy of very early PC games, like Battlezone from 1983. As you can see, all the foreground objects are 3D wireframe. Now, the background is probably just an image that's being moved back and forth as you move about, but everything else is a true 3D object. And this is actually one of the earliest games that I can find with 3D objects that are rotated as part of the gameplay. Here's another early 3D effect I wrote, a rotating block. It has flat filled faces and a high frame rate, but it's cheating by just updating the pixels either end of the block and on a horizontal line that moves down the image. And for a while I assumed that this was the only way to do 3D rotation at a decent frame rate on the IBM PC. Another important early PC game is Microsoft Flight Simulator 1 from 1982. And unlike the other games that I'm showing in this video, this is in an emulator because it works best with composite mode and it's a booter from a 160k floppy disk. The 3D objects in this appear to be wireframe, but you can think of the ground as being flat shaded polygons. So it gives us some hope that we can do 3D flat shading on an IBM PC, albeit at a low frame rate as we have here. This game actually came out before Battlezone, which we saw earlier. In any event, I eventually realized that I could do flat shading and rotation of 3D objects on the PC. This is the first version of my filled polygon code that I could find. It gets along at a decent clip here, although that's not a particularly difficult thing to do with a tetrahedron. If you look really closely, you'll see that some of the edges are quite jagged, and there are other limitations here as well. The code wasn't general enough to display other objects. It was hard-coded to display a tetrahedron. And although it's a relatively large image on the screen, I'm still using just a standard four-color CJ palette, although I did do some alternating pixel colors to try and make it look a little bit more interesting. At some point I started to get really jealous of effects like this on the Commodore 64 with all the colors they seem to have. Uh, this is Edge of Disgrace by Booze Design by the way. And I began to get annoyed that I only had four colors to play with on the PC. So I started to think whether there might be a way of getting around that restriction. And obviously they were just doing all sorts of different objects here. I really had to have at least an icosahedron running on the PC. Well, after quite some thought, I realized that I could get the appearance of many more colors on CGA by using a background color. This is still ordinary four color CGA, and I'm still using a pattern fill to alternate pixel colors, but I'm not just limited anymore to alternating the three original CGA colors and black but I can now alternate with the blue background color, and I chose that to be as far on the spectrum from the other CGA colors as possible. And of course, once your eye sort of blends all of these colors together, it gives you the appearance of all the colors of the rainbow. And at last, I had the coveted icosahedron object. Now, this has 20 faces, so it's pretty sophisticated, but I wasn't really happy with the performance here. It just doesn't look fast enough. I did manage to speed it up, and this is something I've shown on the channel before, but not at this speed or with these colors. This is a half-resolution icosahedron. I've been watching Atari 8-bit demos, and their graphics chip can do a bunch of different modes. If you use low resolution, you get better performance. Now, I didn't know how to do a low-resolution CGA graphics mode, 
but I reasoned that I could double every scan line and it should run faster. I'd still have the same amount of data to put into video RAM, but I'd have less computation to do. And this is the result. The other thing I realized is to give the appearance of motion, you just have to move more. So this rotates further and moves further between each frame. But to my eye, it still looks too jagged. Uh, the low resolution just didn't do it for me. So I decided to go back to the ordinary resolution. Well, I was able to speed up the normal resolution version. This is 21 frames a second, and it was done with more assembly language, of course. No small feat, given that there were thousands of lines of code involved. But I think the result does look better with the higher resolution. There was just one problem, and that is that the code was now monstrously complicated. Instead of just blanking the image out and drawing the new frame in its place, for performance reasons, I was just blanking out the pixels on the very edge of the rotating object that absolutely needed to be blanked for the next frame. And this led to a lot of glitches. It made it difficult to change the speed of the object or the speed of rotation or even the object itself. So I decided I needed a new version that was much more flexible and didn't have these limitations so that I could make more of this effect. Well, I finally realized that it was faster to do all the editing in an off-screen buffer and then just copy everything rapidly over to the video RAM. And then it was easy to add additional effects like the reflection that you see here and also to save copies of images into memory buffers so that I could do an animation and actually have two objects on the screen at the same time. Well, the code was much simpler and easier to make changes to, but remarkably, it was the same speed or even faster than what I'd been doing before. But I was starting to grow tired of the colors. I wanted something more subtle. And besides that, the animation at the end was just displaying the same object twice on the screen. And I thought it would be cool to have different objects displayed at the same time. So I wrote yet another version of the code. Well, another change of color, and I finally realized that I can put a background on the image. After all, I'm rendering everything in an off-screen buffer anyway. And now I have three objects. So the second one's an icosahedron, and the third one is something that looks like an icosahedron, but actually only has 16 faces instead of 20. Of course, all of this took a lot of effort because I had to get the pre-computation for each of the objects way down from 30 seconds all the way down to one second. And that means apart from the animation at the end, this effect is now almost entirely real time. Who thought that would be possible on an IBM PC? And I'm pretty happy with how it came out, except that the animation is a little bit short due to limitations on the amount of memory that there is in the PC. But there's a few more things I can do if I move to another system. Before I do that though, what about those DOS games? I found heaps of them in my research and I want to show you some of the best ones as a teaser. Of course, there's going to be a video about that in the future on the channel. The first game I want to look at here is Pylon Racer from 1985. And this game is significant, apart from being 3D, for a number of reasons. First of all, as you can see, the background color is light blue instead of black. And although this is not a great choice of color, it does make for a more interesting image than a standard CGA palette. The second reason the game is interesting is the plane that you're chasing here is an actual 3D model, not a sprite, and this was pretty revolutionary for Flight Simulator of 1985. The third reason the game is quite interesting is you could actually play it over a 1200 board modem with an opponent instead of chasing the computerized plane. And if you wanted the full version of the game, you could write to the authors and pay $49.95 this is just a demo, which was freely copyable, of course. The next game I want to look at is Dark Side from 1988. And I'll run it for 20 seconds at ordinary IBM PC speed. Then I'll double the speed to simulate a Turbo XT. Now this uses the Freescape engine, which was an early 3D game engine. And regular viewers of the channel might remember the predecessor game Driller, also known as Space Station Oblivion, which used the same engine. There were some later games that did as well, Total Eclipse and Castle Master and their sequels. Now this uses pattern fill, and I would say it's flat shaded, but without any lighting of course, if you're okay with that terminology. 
Now obviously it's designed for a faster CPU, but the speed depends on the number of objects on the screen, so it speeds up and slows down a bit. On the other hand, there's numerous objects being shown at once, but notice it's just using a window, not the full screen, for the 3D part. The game is a kind of combination of a first-person perspective and a puzzle game. You have to figure out what to do at each point in the game. And there's a jetpack uh, that you can fly, and you can also tilt the screen left and right and look up and down. So it's pretty sophisticated overall. But let me show you a really intriguing game with fast polygon fill, which you can see here, in a demo that was distributed with the game, and fast wireframe as well. But this is 1986, and most people still have a 286 or earlier, and so whatever concept the developers had for this game just doesn't fit the technology of the day, in my opinion. So have you figured out the game yet? This is the loading screen, and I'm just showing the end of it here because it does take a while to render. It's eight intricately drawn 3D planets, presumably using the fill routine from the demo. And then this amazing looking full screen 3D planet with filled triangles, presumably the one that you fly over in the game itself. But the game has horrible screeching sound effects and it's just not intuitive to play. You press minus to fly forwards toward the platform and then another key on the keypad to re-render the scene, which you have to do regularly because it doesn't happen automatically. It's not like a flight simulator. Now, when I first saw the graphics here, I certainly recognized that they were unique and it does look impressive and it's certainly very fast. This is only an IBM PC I'm running it on. But after a while, you start to realize that it's a little repetitive. Uh, you are just seeing randomly generated triangles. Now, I might have just got unlucky here. This went on for quite a while, and eventually I reached a great ocean and assumed that something might happen. But this went on for ages as well, and I've removed a lot of frames here. But let me know what you think. Uh, what was this game like back in the day? Uh, did you see it, and uh, what did you think at the time? Anyway, the randomizer eventually has mercy on you, and some dry land appears, and you start to see the namesake of the game. Uh, this is Triclops Invasion, by the way, and presumably this mechanical beast that appears here is the Triclops. But uh, for all the flaws of the game, uh, I was impressed with the graphics, and I think that's what's important here and why I'm showing it in this video. Uh, it was uh, an amazing achievement for the day. It just seems that it was a little bit far ahead of its time. Well, there's going to be more 3D DOS games on the channel in the future. I've been teaming up with the old school PC run by Trickster, and we've come up with let's call it almost a hundred 3D DOS games before 1991. See if you can think of ones that we haven't thought of. Put them in the comments below and I'll let you know if they're on our list. But what I want to do now is get back to the 3D rotating object demo that I've been writing and try it out on this graphics card here. It's a CGA card, but unlike the IBM CGA card, one of the improper modes actually works on this. Now, improper modes were only discovered relatively recently, about 10 years or so ago, and it allows us to get a 320 by 100 resolution mode, so very high resolution. And this is what it looks like. Uh, you get almost the appearance of 10 separate colors on this card, because the pixels are so small, you can't actually see them individually. So let's try it out and see what the effect looks like. Well, here it is, and I'll let it run through a few times so we can check it out. It's not got music or morphing objects like Boo's design, and it's also a little bit stop-start, and I think those are things you'd try to fix if you're going to put it in a real demo. But on this hardware, that could be a tall order. Each of the objects has a little bit of pre-computation before it starts, and this bit where they all rotate is animated, meaning all of memory is filled up and leaving no room for a music system or a loader or other parts of a demo. But I'm still pretty happy with how it came out. Uh, let me know what you think. I've been really keen to show this off on the channel and get your opinion. Uh, let me know in the comments below. Has it been worth all of the effort? 
Now, of course, I could write a version for a 386, say, and use VGA with more colors and have all of the objects animated in real time. But one of the things I can do right now is to run this code as is on a faster system with the same graphics card so that we can still use this in proper mode. So I'm going to run it on my Turbo XT. Uh, it should look the same, but it should give it a nice uplift in performance. So let's check it out. Well, here it is at 10 MHz, and I actually think it's a little too fast in the real-time part now. Let me know what you think. And the final part, being an animation, is going to be the same speed because I've actually locked it to the frame rate of the CRT. To finish off today, I thought I'd show some early PC demos that have 3D rotation in them. So this is Vector Demo by Ultraforce from 1991, and it's running on my 12 MHz 286 machine. Unfortunately, my Seng Labs ET4000 card is not working at the moment, so we're using a slightly slower VGA card here. But of course, we have a sound blaster in this machine. some rotating objects in a demo called Vicky by the Space Pigs, also from late 1991. And here's a mega demo by Destroy from early 1991 called Exhausted. They don't actually have sound in this demo, but there's a Sound Blaster demo that comes along with it, and so I'm going to play the sound from that over the top of the graphics from the demo itself.
final demo I want to show this week is Vectra by The Physical Crew, some of whose members ended up in Triton. This is one of my favourite demos from 1991, but unfortunately the sound doesn't work very well on a 286. It has a high-pitched whistle that I wasn't able to get rid of, and uh, it also sounds distorted. So I'm playing it here without sound, and uh, this is going to be it for this week, but if you'd like to help the channel out, one of the ways you can do that uh, in regard to the algorithm on YouTube is to comment below. It turns out that likes and comments and also watching the video to the end, which you've just done, thank you very much for that, uh, really help the algorithm pick the channel up. So anyway, that's going to be it for this week. Uh, thanks very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you in a later video. Bye.